As some of you probably already know, I recently uploaded a very long video revolving around an early 90s book trilogy known as the Quintoglio Ascension. If you haven't seen that video yet, you should definitely check it out. The link for it is in the description below. But for those of you who have seen it, you'll remember that I mentioned the author of that series, Robert J. Sawyer, also wrote a lot of short stories. And one of these stories is featured in his book called Iterations, which if you remember, is an anthology of some of his science fiction short stories. Initially, the only story that I was interested in from iterations was the one that featured the Quintaglios. But I would eventually find out that there was another short in this book that featured a very dark story revolved around dinosaurs. Now, for the sake of context, for those of you who don't know who Sawyer is, he's a Canadian science fiction author that's known for his science fiction novels and short stories, which have garnered him widespread success. However, in 1987, he would quit writing short stories and instead decided to write his first fictional novel. But aside from that, it was also due to small pay rates and long response times from science fiction magazines. So for about five years, he would stay away from shorter non-fiction stories until one day in 1992, he was approached by Mike Resnick, an American science fiction writer who was putting together a dinosaur anthology called Dinosaur Fantastic, and was essentially commissioning Sawyer to write a short story for it. Sawyer would accept this offer but was nervous, considering he hadn't written science fiction shorts in five years, and felt that he may have lost his touch with it. He would eventually find out that it was quite the opposite, because his short story, titled Just Like Old Times, would be used as the first story featured within the anthology. Along with that, it would also be used in several other anthology books and a magazine called On Spec. It would also be the winner of two awards, the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Award, or the Aurora, for Best English Language Short Story of 1993, and the Crime Writers of Canada's Arthur Ellis Award for Best Short Story of 1993. So yeah, it would become quite a success. And after reading Just Like Old Times for myself, I can see why. The story itself has a very interesting premise, which may sound weird on paper, but trust me, it's not all that crazy. It's a genuinely great story that's executed in a somewhat believable and even disturbing way. Before we get into the story, I do just want to say that it is available for free on Sawyer's official website. So if you're interested in this story and would rather read it for yourself than have somebody just summarize it for you, then I'll leave a link in the description below for that. Alright, I'm not going to keep you guys waiting for too much longer now. Let's go ahead and take a look at Just Like Old Times. The story takes place in the not-too-distant future of 2042. In August of that year, Dr. Rudolf Cohen would be convicted of 37 counts of first-degree murder. Dr. Cohen is a serial killer who was previously a prominent member of the Alberta College of Physicians and Surgeons but was stripped of his titles after it was discovered he was torturing and murdering his patients with surgical tools. The crime was so horrendous that the judge would permit a very unconventional but necessary punishment to fit Cohen's crimes. At some point during this timeline, the Canadian government had been funding the developments of time travel, and progress had been made, but not in the way they had hoped. While you aren't able to time travel your physical body to another point in time, what could be done was projecting a present human's consciousness back in time over to someone else's consciousness from the past. However, the present human would only be able to shadow the other person's consciousness. Have you guys ever watched that Black Mirror episode? I think it's called Black Museum, and they tell a story about that comatose woman whose consciousness was put into her husband's mind, and then later into a teddy bear or something. Kind of a messed up story, but an interesting one nonetheless. This whole time travel mind transferring system thing in this short story is kind of like that. Except of course it involves time travel and there's a lack of communication between the two minds. As far as the short goes, the person from the past has no reason to suspect their mind is being shadowed by another consciousness. The present human would be able to witness history through the eyes of someone from the past, but they wouldn't be able to take control of that person's body or change or manipulate anything in time. When the transferring does happen, there's a link that forms between the present human and the past human which can only be severed if the person from the past that the present human transferred their mind into dies. However, if that were to occur, the present human would die as well. 
This method is called chronotransference, and with all of this information, the whole system may sound useless a little bit, however, it's actually been used as a sort of euthanization method for certain groups of people. People can choose the historical figure they want to shadow the mind of and will be transferred to that mind before the historical figure's expected time of death. And as mentioned before, once that historical figure dies, so does the present human. There's a part of the story that talks about how the social welfare system had been on the verge of collapsing due to human life expectancy in Canada increasing and retirement age decreasing. So to prevent that, they left this chronotransference system open to civilians under the age of 60 to euthanize themselves, given they made that choice for themselves. However, in rare cases, it's also used for executing criminals on death row. Oh yeah, and the last thing about the chronotransference system is that it only works as one person per historical figure. So once that historical figure has been chosen by someone who wants to transfer their mind to, that figure cannot be selected again. However, Cohen wasn't looking to transfer his mind to a specific person, but rather a specific animal. During Cohen's trial, the judge had said he was the most cold-blooded killer to stalk the Alberta landscape since Tyrannosaurus Rex, just before allowing Cohen to be euthanized through means of the chronotransference method. This would inspire Cohen to have his mind transferred to a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Cohen's lawyer would then talk to the professors to see if this was even possible which it is if they had a specimen to work with. After Cohen's lawyer gets approval from the judge to continue this rather unique chronotransference request, the judge is given a list of T-Rex specimens and their probable causes of death. She chooses to have Cohen's mind transferred to a young adult male tyrannosaur that had died from a fatal fall to the ground, presumably down a crevice. And because this chronotransference request requires them to go back that far into the past, Cohen would only be given a few hours within the dinosaur's head before the accident occurs. The chronotransfer people need a few weeks to set things up, and in the meantime, Cohen requests books on the Cretaceous fauna and flora to study, so he can prepare himself for what he's going to see when the transfer does eventually happen. Eventually, the time comes and the transfer goes smoothly. Everything he saw in the prehistoric world, he saw through the eyes of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. The colors of the environment are different from the Rex's perspective, with the tree leaves navy blue, the sky lavender, and the dirt gray. As the adolescent T-Rex wanders around the Cretaceous land, he makes a couple of encounters with the different wildlife. First, with a female T-Rex that he doesn't attack as it most likely sees it as a potential mate rather than a threat. But Cohen isn't interested in that. He takes his pleasure in hurting and killing others. In fact, Cohen is so twisted that according to the story, the only times he himself had orgasmed was during his acts of killing. The next animal they encounter is a Triceratops, which excites Cohen as not only did this mean witnessing the infamous battle between two well-known animals shown in the books he used to read, but it also meant that if the T-Rex kills the Ceratopsian dinosaur, he could potentially feel the same amusement here that he felt when he killed all of his victims when he was still in his own body. But instead of fighting the Triceratops, the T-Rex just walks away, much to Cohen's disappointment. As the T-Rex walks away from the area, Cohen is mentally yelling at it to turn around and attack the Triceratops. And at first the T-Rex continues, but then stops. It takes a moment of hesitation, but as soon as Cohen tells the T-Rex to attack, it turns around and charges, striking the Triceratops back, to which the animal retaliates by striking its horn at the T-Rex's leg. But in the end, the T-Rex would be victorious in this battle as the bite had dealt critical damage to the animal, causing it to bleed heavily. Soon, the trike would fall to its side. As the T-Rex dug into its meal, Cohen is left disappointed, realizing that the kill was not satisfactory enough. He wanted to see the terror and fear in the eyes of his victims as they very slowly and painfully died. With everything happening so quickly, he didn't get a sense of it here. What he was astonished about was his ability to be able to will the T-Rex into attacking the Triceratops, something that was supposed to be impossible for transferees to do. Because according to the physicians who worked on the chronotransference method, to take control over the mind of a person from the past, or in this case an animal, Animal, would mean changing the past, which is considered impossible. Until now, of course. 
Cohen concludes that the only way this is possible was for the T-Rex's brains to be so small and primitive that Cohen's thoughts were powerful enough to essentially take control of the animal. Kind of. The animal still moves around on its own and has its own thoughts, but basically if Cohen nags it enough to do something, it'll do it. Cohen puts this to the test, and after a few failed attempts, the Rex does eventually listen, moving in the directions that Cohen mentally orders. With this newfound control, Cohen seeks out prey, but not just any prey. He's looking for a very specific animal, a mammalian animal, Purgatorius to be exact, the earliest example of a primate that lived during the time of the dinosaurs. He finds one in the underbrush but traps it under the Rex's large foot. The animal, still alive, screams in fear, much to Cohen's delight. To see a live creature's terror, to hear it scream, it was all beautiful to him. What he does next is best explained in the book. The Rex moved its gaping jaws in toward the little mammal, drawing in breath with such force that it sucked the creature into its maw. Normally, the Rex would swallow its meals whole, but Cohen prevented the beast from doing that. Instead, he simply had it stand still, with the little primate running around, terrified, inside the great cavern of the dinosaur's mouth, banging into the giant teeth and great fleshy walls, and skittering over the massive dry tongue. Cohen savored the terrified squealing. He wallowed in the sensation of the animal, mad with fear, moving inside that living prison. And at last, with a great glorious release, Cohen put the animal out of its misery, allowing the Rex to swallow it, the furball tickling as it slid down the giant's throat. It was just like old times. Just like hunting humans. Cohen realized that these mammals were scarce during this time period, and with the selection of a young T-Rex, his ability to control it, and his confidence that his lawyer will find a bunch of legal loopholes to prevent the court from pulling the plug on his transfer after they find out that he's been in there longer than the expected few hours, Cohen knew he had more than enough time to pursue this hunt. The hunt of humanity itself. Killing off enough of the already endangered Purgatorius will surely result in no descendants, meaning no human evolution. Cohen realized that this was better than old times. And there you have it. That was Just Like Old Times. And it was a pretty dark story. I can see why it was as popular as it was since it has a very interesting premise to it. Having one's mind, especially a serial killer, transferred into the mind of a dinosaur is definitely unique in my opinion. By putting these very different things together, a serial killer and a dinosaur, it really puts to perspective the differences between the terrors of beasts versus the terrors of man. While yes, dinosaurs can be terrifying animals, especially during those times when this short story was released since they were still seen as traditional movie monsters by many, of course aside from the one movie that would change that to some degree, this short shows that the terrors of man are much worse and lie well beyond just being able to kill. I interpret Cohen's ability to control and manipulate the T-Rex's mind with his own thoughts to be a representation of the mental power we wield as human beings that can either separate us from the animals or make us worse than them. Overall, it's definitely one of those stories that leave you thinking about it for a while after finishing it. At least it did for me. And that's why this video is out before the next episode of the Paleontology French Theories Iceberg. But don't worry, it's being worked on right now as we speak. I'm hoping to get that out soon, and after that, I have a special video coming out in celebration of the release of a certain dinosaur documentary. But you will see more of that next month. For now, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did and haven't seen my Quintaglio Ascension Trilogy video yet, definitely check it out. I think you guys would really like it. Thank you so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.